Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to today's student town hall. Uh, my name is Ali Baggett, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am delighted to be your MC and moderator for today's session. Um, I'm very fortunate enough to live and work very close to the university right now. So before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose, traditional, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Um, I'd like to just encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the land from which you are joining us today. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to be here with you guys today. I think this is a fantastic opportunity to engage with our president. Um, I am a UVic alumni. I graduated with a biochemistry degree like way back, um, but I'm also now a current student. I'm pursuing my master of education. And some of you may know me as the person behind the scenes of UVic social media accounts, as I'm also a staff member as the UVic social media coordinator. Um, before we get started today, I just wanna run through a couple housekeeping, housekeeping items uh, so that you can best participate in today's session. So we're very fortunate to have live captioning and sign language interpretation, uh, both available throughout the entire session. We have our fantastic captionist, Alex, and our interpreter, Sarah, both from the Island Deaf and Hard of Hearing Center. So thank you so much, Alex and Sarah, for being here. Um, you're gonna see Sarah's beautiful face throughout the entire event. Um, but if you wanna access the live captioning, you need to click the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, and just to note that we are also recording this webinar for those members of our community who can't join us today. Um, throughout uh, today, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen that we have the Zoom Q&A function turned on for this session. Um, we'd really encourage you to pop your questions in there. And um, one thing just to note is that we're going to try and choose the questions that are most popular. So to help us um, get through all of those questions, have a read through the questions that are already in the question bank to see if any of those questions sort of around the same lines of something that you wanna ask. And instead of duplicating that question, just give it the little thumbs up and upvote it. And a little tip, the sooner you get your question into the question bank, uh, the more likely people are gonna have a chance to upvote it. Um, so that can happen throughout the session. Um, and then we'll get to them um, towards the latter half of the session, Kevin will address those. Um, but before we get going, um, I wanna know a little bit uh, more about you guys so that I, I know that I'm not talking to an empty void. So we're gonna launch a Zoom poll, which I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, so where are you guys joining us from? You can pop your answers into the Zoom poll and we'll give a few seconds here so everybody can get their answers in. And it looks like 79% of you guys are from Victoria. So you were fortunate enough to enjoy the beautiful sunshine uh, that we have today. Um, and the rest of you are from BC and the rest of Canada. So thanks for joining us today. Um, I now have the great privilege to introduce to you guys uh, our UVic President and Vice Chancellor, Kevin Hall. Thanks, Ali, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I want to also begin by recognizing uh, language and land and acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory our university stands and to the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich people whose historical relationships with the land continues to this day. And I'd like to add, I'd, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and personally uh, pledge the walk on the path to reconciliation together. I also wanted to just point out at the start, it, this is a national day of, of observance for COVID-19 and the university sends out its warmest condolences to those who have lost uh, loved ones over the past year in the pandemic. So I'm now in my uh, fifth month or actually 131st day of my presidency as, as the new president and vice chancellor at the University of Victoria. And for me, it's great to be connecting with the community in particular today. It's great to be uh, connecting with you uh, students. Um, we'd love to have done this in person, of course, but the pandemic has made uh, business as usual incredibly challenging for us. So today's town hall for me is more of an opportunity for me to listen to you rather than you to listen to me to talk for too long. So I'll spend perhaps five minutes making some remarks, but I'm really keen on, on your questions and, and, and understanding how you feel about the University of Victoria at this point in time and what your dreams and aspirations are. 
for the future. At the end of the day, undergraduate students, you're really the heart of our university. We're here to deliver a high quality education to you know, create opportunities for you in the future. And also here to serve the community and, and have you as, as our graduates go out and work in the community and really make a change and make impact. Um, you know, it's been a, an incredibly tough year for all of us. Uh, we've heard this in the surveys we did with students. We've heard it from our faculty in the surveys we've done in the fall. And uh, we'll speak a little bit more about that later on. Uh, to keep our community safe, we're really forced to make, we were forced to make a really rapid transition to remote learning about a year ago. And that predated my arrival here. I was in Australia up until um, in November and COVID was quite different in Australia. The universities were quite different. There wasn't as much COVID and, and it, it's been quite a different journey here for all of you. And I'm just really trying to understand now the impact that it's had across our campus. So first of all, I just wanted to, to commend you for your commitment. Uh, I understand that we've had very little issues with people dropping out of courses. So I, I admire your resilience and thanks for your patience. Uh, this is not a pandemic that any of us designed or wanted to have, but it is the reality and we're all trying to get through this together. And while we're a really strong com community of learners and educators, you know, this has created a lot of challenges for us. It's created a lot of stress for all of us. And I know for you, for students, many of you faced a lot of anxiety there's issues around finances and financial stability and the isolation of just not actually being on a campus, being around your peers has, has been a tremendous, uh, tremendous issue for all of us. Um, the provincial health officer expects that by July, every eligible adult will have their first dose of vaccine. So this has been a really encouraging change over the last couple of weeks from, from where we thought we were heading into September. And I don't know if any of you looked at this this week on Monday, uh, Dr. Henry and the Ministry of Advanced Education advised us, the university presidents, that they felt fairly confident that we're going to be returning to face-to-face uh, -face instruction on our campuses uh, as early as September. So that's a really encouraging note. Uh, we hope everything plays out as, as the provincial health officer anticipates with the vaccination and, and the reduction in the spread of COVID. And of course that could change in a heartbeat, uh, but we are very optimistic we're going to have you back on campus uh, in the fall. Currently, we're working right now with the ministry to develop our guidelines for coming uh, onto campus. We hope to get those published soon. At every step, we have to work with the public health uh, officer for the, uh, for the province and all of our associated partners in Victoria Island Health to make sure we've got the right measures in place to keep people safe. So we know that many of you, many students, and many of our fa uh, faculty and staff are really eager to return to campus. But we also understand a few of you are a little anxious about coming back to campus. And it's really important to stress that the health and well-being of our community will remain our, our top priority. So I just conclude on the COVID bit by saying I'm, I'm just absolutely delighted that, to think that we could be welcoming students back uh, to the campus this fall. I've been here five months. Um, I'm a person that likes to get out onto campus and I like to, uh, to sort of have a chat with people walking around campus and it's been a very different experience for me as well. Uh, coming back to Canada in November into a situation where we have a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of regulations and guidelines around COVID. I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about myself before I turn it back over to you to ask your questions. I'm the first in my family to have the opportunity to go to university. My uh, parents emigrated from the UK when I was a very young age. Uh, they were factory workers and they did that because they thought they wanted to have their kids uh, an opportunity to go and get a good education. And in my family, there's uh, three brothers and sisters in addition to me. And we all have undergraduate degrees and, and three of us have uh, postgraduate degrees. And we're all in education, two, two university professors, one high school teacher and one public school teacher. And for me, uh, my family has experienced firsthand the tremendous impact that education can make. It's an equalizer, it's a slingshot to your future. And one of my highest priorities uh, in my presidency at the University of Victoria will be to make sure we create equitable pathways into education. I'm really concerned that only 35% of the population comes to university in Canada. That hasn't changed in the last 20 or 25 years. And so one of the things I'd really like to work on is how can we create <clears throat> enabling pathways? How can we create uh, opportunities for students that perhaps didn't graduate high school, didn't like studying at the time, didn't want to go to university 
how can we get them back in the, into the system and give them the fantastic opportunity that a university can provide? I see my role as president as someone who really enables things to happen. Um, I'm not here because I like to be called the president. I'm here because I think I have the tools to kind of build the vision and, and the tools to, to try to, to influence our government, to influence our community, to support our university in building the university to be what we want it to be, what you want it to be as students, what we want it to be as faculty and staff members. And that'll certainly be the priority over the next year is to build that collective vision of what you Vic should aspire to and, and how, how we can create a university that makes a tremendous impact in our own lives, but more importantly, in the lives of people in the community across the country and, and on a global, a global platform. I spent the last um, 131 days apparently um, listening to a lot of people and I'm on a so-called listening tour and today's town hall is, is part of that tour. I'm really interested in getting out and meeting the community, discussing and, and getting great ideas. And so today's discussions will really help me and my team, my leadership team, inform the goals and priorities going forward. I've met over 2000 people so far in about 110 meetings since I've been here internal, external meetings, and those meetings have been with students, they've been with staff, they've been with faculty, alumni, and on an external front, I've been meeting with the local, federal, and, and provincial governments. I've been meeting with industry and business partners, really trying to get a sense of what is UVic and what makes it tick, and, and where are the things working really well, where are things not working so well, and what do we aspire to be? What I'm hearing coming out of my listening tour so far is, is climate action, divestment, sustainability, a green focused future, a plastic free future. These are all important to all of us across the community, whether you're a student or a staff member. Equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism is absolutely a top priority. And I hear we're doing okay, but we could be doing much better. And so it's going to be a really important thing to start to drive action around our equity, diversity, inclusivity platform. I've also heard We've been leaders around truth, respect, and reconciliation, but perhaps we've lost that leadership position or perhaps leading isn't good enough. We've got to do more and more. We've got to have more of our actions directed towards truth, respect, and reconciliation. Access to education I mentioned earlier is important to me. Everything from affordability, um, how can we deliver both on and off campus education if that's appropriate, a tuition, there's housing costs in Victoria. I'm, I'm like you, many of you, I, I've come to Victoria and been shocked by what I've had to pay to live in Victoria compared to where I was in Australia, living right on the beach in Newcastle. Um, so that's an issue for all of us. There's everything from textbook costs, accessibility, accommodation, and those are things that we'll try to tackle over the next year to, to see how we can help uh, alleviate some of those problems. Student experience has been a big part of my career. I've been 35 years an academic. I've won teaching awards, and I've always been concerned that we deliver a high quality education to our students. And so issues around fall planning, what's gonna happen in September? Um, are we going to continue with a hybrid type of learning? Are we gonna have this blend of online learning, face-to-face -face learning, uh, the cost of education versus the quality? All of these are issues that we've really got to deal with over, over, the, next, uh, over the next year or so. Uh, community engagement's been a really big part of my career. I just truly think a university has a role in society to make an impact on our local community where the university is located. It needs to make an impact across this country, particularly with our marginalized populations. And we need to get out there and be, a, be a, an exemplar and showing leadership uh, across the planet to make this a better planet for people to, to live so that we have more equity across this, this planet. So community engagement will feature big <clears throat> in the next little while. So that's enough for me for now. I thought we, we'd have another Zoom poll and the question I'm going to ask you is, if you were the president, what would you focus on? And you've got a choice and you're going to pick uh, three of these choices to tell me what you're going to focus on if you were the president. So we'll give you a little time to vote and you can see early on we're getting equity, diversity, sustainability coming in. Supporting student success, <clears throat> connecting with community, Seems like there's a good uh, sense that all of these things are, are, are important. There's not too many that are low on the list. I think we'll just keep it open for, for uh, a few more seconds to make sure everybody gets a chance. We've got uh, three quarters voted now.
And it's great to see. I think uh, what we're what we're seeing here um, is that many of these answers are similar to what I'm hearing across many of my other meetings that have gone on in campus, whether they're with focus groups of students, whether they're with faculty and staff. We're really looking to support uh, some change and sustainability and climate action, equity, diversity, inclusivity is really important in supporting student success are coming out at the top. So that's fantastic. If we could take uh, take that poll down. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm going to be continuing my listening tour and connecting with as many students, staff and faculty as I can over the next uh, couple of months, really listening and understanding what the culture at UVic is. At the end of the tour, which will finish up uh, sometime at the end of May, I'll actually prepare uh, some videos and a few documents that highlight what I've been hearing as I've been talking to the community at UVic, and that will really help us inform the future direction of the institution. So Ali, uh, back over to you. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, wow, what a long but really exciting list of uh, themes that you have uh, on your plate. Um, you said, Kevin, that you weren't uh, here just to be called uh, president. So if UVic students were walking across campus and they ran into you, uh, what should they call you? President Hall or <laughs> what do you prefer? Uh, look, I prefer Kevin. You know, that's uh, that's what people call me. Um, and that's that's my name. So please, you know, it's Kevin. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. OK, so uh, let's dive into some of the questions. So the way this is going to work, uh, we wanted to make this a little more engaging for you. So we worked uh, with the UVSS um, and they've created five uh, videos on different topics that we know undergraduate students really care about. Um, we're gonna play each of those videos um, and then we'll give Kevin a few minutes to respond to each of those five uh, video questions. And just as a reminder, while this is all happening, you can put your own questions into the Zoom Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And a friendly reminder, if you joined us late, please read through the questions that are already in the question bank so that you can either upvote with the little thumbs up, uh, a question that's very similar to yours so we don't have duplicate questions. And also just a reminder to be respectful with whatever uh, you choose to post and remember not to share any personal information. Um, yeah, so we're gonna start the, first, uh, start the first video which is about affordability and quality of education. Hi everyone, my name is Izzy. I'm a director at large with the UVic Student Society and my question today is around affordability. <clears throat> so many students are feeling like the quality of their education is not worth the continually rising cost of tuition. These feelings are heightened by a global pandemic that has shifted education almost entirely online where quality has decreased significantly. So my question is, under these conditions where educational quality is declining, why does tuition continue to increase? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Ify, for that question. That's a, that is a great question. Uh, I, and first, I'd, I'd like to start off by actually challenging you that the idea of the quality of education has declined. I, I think uh, we all understand that learning and teaching online has been really challenging, both for our students, but also for some of our faculty. And we've actually heard from many who have found that it's worked really well for them. And 35% of our students are telling us it actually works better for them on this online format. And I think like any class, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, there are differences in quality depending on the professor you get and the style that they teach in and, and the way that you learn. And styles don't always match up. So I think, you know, we're doing the best we can in terms of delivering the education. But, you know, that said, I understand there's been a lot of challenges. The pandemic's really challenged us in many areas of our life, not just teaching and learning. In the fall, we surveyed students and faculty about their experiences around learning and teaching online. And we listen to your concerns. We worked hard to support our faculty and students in this new online environment. And based on what we heard in the survey, we've tried to work with our academic leaders and instructors to really make those adjustments and improvements uh, that, that we felt are, are, are you know, easy to make and ones that we could make as an institution, uh, particularly related to workload and to address concerns around student mental health and, and well-being. We've also provided resources uh, to our academic staff to really improve the online experience. And we've, we've tried to work on expectations, technologies, methods of engagements. So the survey for us was really helpful. And I hope the students have had a better experience or more positive experience, let's say overall this term compared to last term. Online teaching for many of us has been new and we know that not only students have found this difficult, they found it a different experience. So have the, so have the professors. 
So quality aside, the, the issue of, tu of tuition is really important. And I think it's important to recognize that through the pandemic, uh, we have really had a change in the costs at the university of delivering education. In fact, we've actually put more money in. We've moved to uh, our move to online instruction that we made needed to make significant technology and training. We put about $18 million into that this year. We had to have more teaching assistance and additional support uh, for students in mental health and bursaries and scholarships. Universities, unfortunately, by government law, aren't, aren't allowed to make either a profit or a loss. So the key for us is really balancing our budgets. Tuition uh, from students makes up about 40% of our total operating revenue. The rest comes from, from the province. And what that does is our total operating budget, it allows us to provide the cost for delivering uh, instruction, the programs, the support that's put in place around the student. That's done during the pandemic and it's gonna be done when we return to campus. Our increases around the tuition are set by the government uh, of, the, of uh, British Columbia, it's a 2% maximum increase at this point in time. And we always consult with our other universities across the sector. So we work with the, the other 20 plus universities in British Columbia to, to work on a consistent fee increase. The bulk of our cost at a university uh, um, is quite different than most businesses. About 80% of our costs are for salaries. So those are salaries of people that support teaching, learning, and research. So these are, if you like, the professors that you get to deliver your class, the staff that are dedicated to student support, mental health counseling, technology support, teaching platforms, and the staff that you see around the grounds, keeping the grass cut, keeping the buildings maintained, and keeping our campus a place that we want to come and, and study and work. And, um, you know, those typical uh, groups and, and, and uh, faculty staff and, that work here are um, entitled to an increment in their a salary every year, as is the public sector across British Columbia. And that's typically set around the cost of living, which happens to be around 2%. If we didn't increase uh, our revenues, we, we wouldn't have enough money to actually operate the business as we do now. And then we'd have to start making cuts across the board. I don't think anybody wants to see us make cuts to levels of support. So it's a balancing act for us uh, around looking at where, you know, where we can raise tuition. But I will say one of the things we absolutely understand is that there's, there's hardship out there, hardship because of COVID, hardship even in the best of times. And we're continuing to look at ways that we can increase our bursaries to provide assistance to students where they really need that uh, financial assistance. So I hope that answers your question, Nikki. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, it's certainly a very interesting breakdown that you provided. Hopefully that provides some good context. Um, our next question uh, by video is uh, about the pass-fail grading. So let's roll that second video. Good evening, President Hall. My name is Joshua Fosnacht, and I am the newly elected Director of International Student Relations for the 2021-2022 Board of Directors, and I use he, him pronouns. Over 50% of undergraduate students indicated that major barriers to accessibility in online learning include difficulty navigating online course materials, insufficient time, and confusion accessing and using course materials. Students described high variability of quality among courses, influencing their ability to learn effectively. A recommendation for the Senate retroactively extending the availability of the pass-fail option for all courses for the summer 2020 and fall 2020 term, and also for the Senate to commit to implementing the pass-fail option for following semesters, held predominantly online in COVID-19, has been put forward by the UVSS wherein we continue to be in a state of emergency and the quality of education since the closure in March has continued to cause undue stress and anxiety on students. Will you support and advocate for pass-fail options for all online semesters? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Joshua, for, for that question as well. Um, you know, I wasn't here last year when the decision was made to go to pass, uh, pass bill grading, but my understanding, it was made actually available last spring, really in response to the sudden turn and unexpected transition from a face-to-face -face environment to a totally online in a matter of weeks. The unprecedented changes to how courses were delivered and how student work was assessed was done at a, you know, at a, at a fairly late point in the term. And the feeling at that time was it had a potential to significantly affect student grades. I think in some respects, in the last question, I tried to uh, deal with some of the issues around quality. And I think that we've made changes to the online delivery. So hopefully the quality is, is changing. 
the pass fail option last uh, year was, uh, you know, was provided the flexibility that we needed at the time. It was really meant to compensate for the disruption in that one particular term. It was never intended to be an ongoing uh, item that was going to be offered throughout the pandemic. Uh, grading policy itself is determined by Senate. The Senate, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a body that governs all the academic decisions for the university. It includes representation from our uh, faculty members, uh, from our faculties, the faculty association, but it also includes student representation. And Senate um, does as its job is, it has a good robust debate around all the issues that are brought forward to Senate. At the February Senate meeting, uh, based on the feedback we heard from students in the UVSS, Senate in fact voted to, to add a note to all the transcripts that recognizes that the term uh, the terms that, that were taking place online under the pandemic, and that'll be identified in the transcripts. And the note itself is really intended to provide uh, the context that the learning was done um, during the pandemic, and it may have an impact on, on the academic careers. Um, and some of you may be aware that the UVSS sent a letter to Senate earlier this year asking for the pass-fail option to be implemented uh, again. And discussions right now are ongoing at Senate. It's a very complicated issue and there's a lot of considerations for different students. For example, if you have any interest in, in going uh, to do graduate studies, then the pass fail is gonna impact your potential opportunities to get into a graduate school because those often are, are marks based. Uh, scholarship awards for both undergraduate scholarships and scholarships uh, to get into grad school are also something that this is based on marks at this point in time. So. You know, the pass fail is not quite as simple as it sounds, but I will guarantee that it's going to get a robust look at Senate and Senate uh, will do what it is supposed to do is, is to have those conversations and, and decide in, in the majority of what the action is to take. I just I recommend if you're having specific challenges with particular classes or a particular instructor, I just encourage you to raise those concerns with either the chair that, or the director of the, of the department or through the ombudsman. And also use your academic advisors. They can be a great source of guidance. And in fact, last spring, we encouraged everybody who was considering the pass-fail option to talk to an advisor about the potential impact it might have on their, um, on their uh, academic careers in the future. So thanks for that question, Joshua. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of things that Senate is going to have to consider uh, when making those decisions. So appreciate that breakdown. Um, our third video uh, question is about accessibility. Hi, my name is Parth and I use he and they pronouns and I'm a fourth year student in environmental studies and political science at UVic and I'm also a director at large on the UVic Student Society. While concerns surrounding online learning have started to be addressed, the inequities created by them have not been resolved and many of the existing accessibility provisions have not translated to the online learning environment. As president, how will you improve accessibility at UVic as students with disabilities continue to face inequities in our academic experience, both in our current learning environment online and in the future once we return to in-person learning? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, uh, Perth. First off, look, we're absolutely not perfect as a university around issues of equity, diversity, and inclusivity. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that, but we try really hard. We've all adopted just a ton over the past year. Both instructors and students have had to learn uh, about new ways of learning. We've got new ways of teaching, and we're facing a, a variety of challenges related to the pandemic. But we really care about students facing barriers to their education. And there's lots of people on campus that are dedicated to really uh, you know, drive the, the, the work that ensures that UVic is it's accessible as possible. The Center for Accessible Education provides programs and coordinates academic accommodations for students. Uh, Cal also acts as consultants to faculty instructors and works with the university community to help really create a more accessible learning environment. And if you have any specific challenges, please reach out to the Center for Accessible Learning and, and you know they can they can help. Um, the Division of Learning and Teaching Support and Innovations is working currently with faculty and instructors to really ensure that the course design and assessments are accessible. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, we, we undertook a fall survey. Um, accessibility came up as a key issue in the survey. 
And we're trying to apply the recommendations that came out of that survey to both to improve the online experience, but also to improve our in-person experience. It will happen again uh, this semester. In response to the concerns we've heard from students and instructors, we've hired two new learning designers and we're actively working with instructors on accessible course design and, and how we go about doing assessment. We're also supporting faculty and instructors to use the principles of universal design for learning and universal designs and approach to designing all courses in ways that make them accessible and in ways that effectively support students with academic accommodations and that minimize the need for individual adaptations and accommodations. And some of the ways these principles can be applied are through flexible exam start times. We've got alternative forms of assessment, multimedia approaches, offering options for students about how they can demonstrate their knowledge and right down to reviewing course assessments for maximum accessibility and flexibility. So, you know, we're really trying to work on this as a, as a, as a campus. Uh, you can check out uvic.ca backslash learn anywhere. It's a virtual center for student learning and provides some great resources and support. Equally as important, we're always looking for ways to improve the student experience post COVID. And we will reassess student needs in consultation with LTSI and Cal and we'll resource uh, the programs accordingly. So, you know, we're listening, we're making changes according to what we hear and uh, very open to more feedback. And at the end of this uh, session today, I'll give you uh, an address that you can actually send suggestions into. So thanks for that question. Thanks, Kevin. Um, our fourth video is on EDI and support for BIPOC students. So we're gonna roll that fourth video. Hi, President Hall. Um, my name is Marielle. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a fourth year student in Pacific and Asian Studies. Um, I have a question regarding equity, inclusion, and diversity. So we know that the current administration at UVic really emphasizes equity and respect and inclusion um, in order to build a really strong learning environment and thus produce research. Uh, in fact, we as the student community really appreciate um, that commitment. Um, but given that systemic racism is a pervasive part of society in North America, um, Black, Indigenous, and communities of color are often overlooked, interrupted, and silenced. We wanted to ask what steps the university is taking to combat the salient effects of discrimination, and specifically, um, what will you do in your role as president to center BIPOC voices and encourage systemic change at UVic? to address institutionalized bias. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Marielle, for that question. Um, I guess one of the disappointing things for me returning to Canada after eight years in Australia is to see that uh, we really haven't moved the, um, moved the bar on, on discrimination. I've had a personal lifelong commitment to equity, diversity, inclusivity uh, because of a number of personal reasons. And it's important uh, for me that you show leadership, not only on our own campus and, and deal with the significant number of issues we still have on our own campus, but that we in fact act as an exemplar in the community that we go out and, and, and we, we change attitudes within the community around us um, because things aren't moving as they should in Canada. And we're, I'm absolutely committed to making sure that this has a top priority at the institution. Like many institutions, um, uh, universities, uh, industry, private companies, um, we're, we move too slowly. We are often uh, guilty of over planning everything and making sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And, you know, in my first uh, 130 days here at the university, I've been speaking to students, staff and faculty and have really been taken to heart the challenging stories that I've heard. Um, my leadership team and I were absolutely committed to make action happen sooner than later. We shouldn't be planning and continue to plan for the next few years. We gotta be acting now. Before I actually started in Newcastle, or sorry, in Victoria, from Newcastle as the president, um, for, the, for the three months before I came, I've been working with the Office of Equity and Human Rights here at UVic to design a process that's really going to build on our commitment at UVic uh, to embed practices of equity, diversity, accessibility, inclusion, and dialogue throughout the university community. And I can tell you effective immediately we're using an equity-centered action-based design. This is a new process for this university and EQHR will be leading the development of our equity action plan. The process emphasizes doing rather than over planning before taking any action. 
And the action plan is going to be centered uh, around the experience and expertise of the most marginalized uh, populations across our campus. And the aim is going to be really to enact a transformative change here at UVic and within our community. Uh, we, we don't want incremental change, we want transformative change. This month, we're establishing our first Reflection and Challenge Committee. This committee is going to use equity-centered principles that recognize and eliminate barriers to participation by people with lived experience, alongside with members of the administration and the leadership team. The committee member recruitment for this challenge is going to begin this month, and the action plan will hopefully be finalized and ready to implement um, later on this year. I'm actually really excited by this process and the possibilities of making changes quickly. And those will be changes that really improve the day-to-day -day experiences of our impacted, our affected, and our marginalized students, staff, and faculty. So uh, thanks, thanks for that question. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I think it's really uh, it's really exciting to see the, the focus on the process of doing. I think that's a really, really big statement. Um, our last uh, video question before we get to your Q&As in the Zoom chat um, is on divestment. So we're going to roll that last video. Hi, my name is Robin Pollard. I'm an Indigenous Studies and Environmental Studies double major and I use she, her pronouns. There was a massive outpour of support that we received from students about your recent decision to make the Working Capital Fund fossil fuel free. This is a really major stride in the right direction. Unfortunately, the UVic Foundation has not stated targets for decarbonization and negative screening and does not use emissions data or analysis to inform long-term investment decision making. While we understand that the UVic Foundation is a separate legal entity, your administration has considerable influence on the Foundation Board's overall direction and priorities. Giving you VIC's promises on decolonization and sustainability, what is your plan to ensure full divestment in the near future? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Robin. And, um, you know, every single meeting I hold on campus, students, staff, and faculty uh, issues around climate change and sustainability rise to the top as being really important issues for members of our, of our community. And of course, uh, decarbonization uh, in both our practice, our day-to-day -day practice and operations and in our investments are a really important part of that. And, and you'll note, I use the word decarbonization. Divestment could be divestment from any type of, uh, of portfolio of, of stock. And I'll actually speak to that a little bit later on because I've got a challenge for you, for the students. Um, but as I say, you know, this has come up at every engagement we've had uh, during my listening tour, and it's something that's extremely important. And, and, I, and thank you for pointing out my leadership team and I, you know, we share your concern and we acted very quickly with our capital fund. You also mentioned the foundation and it's separate from the university. It has its own investment strategy and it does, but you're right. We do have some influence over that. And I, you know, actually am very impressed by the numbers that I've just been uh, privy to. I asked to, to have a look at our investment portfolio in fossil fuels and what we've been doing over the years. And the foundation uh, has really gone from uh, holding over 40 million in fossil fuels two years ago to now less than 10% of that value. And, and I think we actually will be fossil free over the next few years. They haven't done this under a banner of divestment. They've done this under the banner of socially responsible investment. And I'm gonna get back to that in a little while, but I'm very, confident that we're going to see a total um, uh, decarbonization of our investment portfolio over the next few years at this university. And I've actually asked uh, our communications team to prepare um, a document outlining the exact investments in fossil fuels over the past five years and the forecast that we're going to have over the next two years. And just uh, stay tuned. That'll be out, uh, I hope, relatively soon. Now, getting back to investment and, and divestment in multiple things, I'm really trying to push socially responsible investment. And in fact, it turns out that our foundation, if you look across the country at universities, our foundation is absolutely leading the country in socially responsible investment. Socially responsible investment includes as a subset divesting from fossil fuels, but it really looks at uh, unintended or intended harms to other marginalized populations on the planet, the notion of socially responsible investment. And I'm absolutely amazed at how many Canadian and global companies take their offshore, uh, their operations offshore and violate everything from labor laws, child labor laws, slavery laws, environmental laws. And so I'm gonna ask you, and I'm gonna challenge you as students to do your part 
in addition to focusing on, on the investment piece or the divestment out of fossil fuels or the divestment out of other things that are socially ir irresponsibility. I also want you to, as, as a group of students, I want you to send signals to where it hurts these companies. Stop using their services, stop buying their products. Let's not just change the environment. Let's change the plight of over 50% of the world's population who are marginalized. And whether it's cobalt mining in the Congo or glass chip manufacturing in Southeast Asia to support certain brands of mobile phones or it's chocolate production in South America or the sports clothing that you're wearing. Violations of the very basic human rights and dignities continue to be committed around this world at an alarming rate. So uh, what I'd really like is for you to get behind me and let's work on this together and really push this socially responsible investment portfolio. So thanks for the question. Thanks, Kevin. And I'm sure we're going to touch on this topic a little more through the, the Zoom Q&A, which is um, where we're going to go now. Um, so I'm going to go through the questions as quickly as I can, um, but give Kevin uh, time to give you guys a thorough answer. Um, I'm going to go through as many as we can, um, and we're going to start at the top. So just, again, make sure that you're upvoting questions instead of duplicating them in the chat. And um, I'll read the questions regardless. And Kevin, if you feel you've already touched on these, um, you can feel free to add or, or, or paraphrase what you've already uh, spoke to. So um, our first question is from Emma Jane. And the question is, can you tell us about specific examples of climate action and decolonization projects you plan to complete in the next year? Um, okay, thanks for the question. I guess my answer would be, I'm not going to give you specific projects at this point in time, because I think it's really important that we build this action plan together. And I'm really, really excited by the climate sustainability and action plan process that's going on right now. It'll be a very uh, consultative process. It will uh, look at all of our operations together. Uh, it's something that I went through myself at uh, both uh, the University of Guelph, where I chaired the president's uh, task force on sustainability and also at Newcastle, where I was in charge of uh, developing the sustainable development plans for uh, the University of Newcastle, which included us becoming the first university in Australia to have 100% uh, um, renewable energy, which is a huge challenge in, uh, in Australia, not so much of a challenge in Canada. Um, so I just think it's really important that we work together as a community, students, staff, and faculty, and build our cl climate sustainability and action plan to go over all our spheres of operation, everything from our teaching and learning through to our research that we do, but our operations, our engagement with the community, how can we go out into the community and, and, and uh, impart our knowledge to help drive change throughout the community as well. So that process is underway right now. The CS, uh, the CSAP, uh, Climate Sustainability and Action Plan is underway. I'm really excited. I've, I've uh, ask the two co-chairs to be really bold with the initiatives to make sure we look at an all of institution response and to leave uh, no stone unturned. And, and I, I just think we've got a tremendous opportunity to design a, a made for you Vic um, a climate sustainability and action plan. And I look forward to all of your input into that. I'll have my own ideas that I'll certainly put into the, into the mix, but I wanna make sure we, we agree as a community what's important. And that will include setting targets uh, for the future. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, it's certainly not one person's job to uh, to outline that. Um, so the next question here is from Sophia. Um, and Sophia says, we asked President Hall to sign a campus pledge to break free from plastic. This pledge aims to guide campuses toward the long-term elimination of single-use disposable plastics. Okay, so sorry, Ali, was a question they're going to ask me or they have asked me? <laughs> <laughs> I would consider this an ask. Okay, good, thank you. Um, I I'd be, would be very happy to consider that and work with my leadership team to see what we can do in that space. Awesome. Okay, moving on to Michelle. This question is around co-op and practicum requirements. Um, and the major difference between co-op requirements and practicum requirements is that co-ops are generally paid and practicums are mainly not. Both have been argued to be forms of labor and fall under the notion of paid internships. However, practicums occur in fields like nursing, education, and social work. And it has been argued the unpaid nature of practicums reflects the gender wage gap and devaluing of work by women. What are your thoughts surrounding this and how will you address this issue during the presidency? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Um, I guess I will say two things to that. First of all, my experience in Australia is both co-ops and practicums are, are paid um, 
enterprises and they're paid at going wages. That, that's because uh, Australia has very strong uh, labor laws. In Canada, we don't seem to have the same laws. In Canada, I think the difference that I can recollect in my uh, experiences in Canada, I'm an engineer by training. Um, uh, co-ops are very um, co uh, common in engineering and we have one at UVic and, and being paid to do your co-op is, is standard. Practicums are a very different thing in Canada. Quite often practicums are a requirement or a regulation of the accrediting, accrediting body. So for example, if you study a nursing degree, if you want to get a, a license to practice nursing, then you have to go through the accreditation programs and that means you have to do, do the practicums. As to the history of why these aren't paid or paid at, at uh, decent rates in Canada, I really am not sure, but that's something I'll look into with my team. It's not something we, you know, we can't, we can, we can make, uh, I guess so we can make some waves, if you like, uh, towards some of these accrediting bodies, but we certainly wouldn't be able to do something ourselves, which would be different from what the accrediting bodies need for the other institutions. But I, I'll promise I'll take that away and have a look at the question. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, so for the next question, there's a bit of context uh, written that I'm sure everyone can read about pipeline infrastructure of the fossil fuel industry. But the question is, considering that the fossil fuel industry is putting marginalized communities at high risks related to environmental change, would you consider it ethical for UVic to continue investing in fossil fuels? Well, I think I've, I've hopefully I've addressed that, um, that question in my answer to, uh, I think the fourth video, I think, um, you know, we are uh, committed as an institution to uh, decarbonize. We're committed to continue our fantastic research that goes on around uh, renewable energy systems, around integrated energy systems. And we, we do a lot of work here around sustainability and reducing uh, carbon footprints, not just energy-based carbon footprints. And so I think, uh, you know, yeah, we, we absolutely have a commitment to making sure that uh, we're doing our bit. And in fact, we're showing leadership in, uh, in climate sustainability. Um, this next question is around um, international uh, tuition. So Rahul says um, they're an international student from Nepal. And when they use the tuition estimator for an engineering undergrad student, it estimated about 18,000 a year. But in reality, the bill was about 29,000 because that year the tuition was raised for all new international students. And then it was promised that the tuition would increase at 4% per year. However, last year it increased 10%. And uh, this year they're paying 34,000. So um, they're not complaining that it's expensive, uh, but the estimates were a little bit off. So the questions are, uh, how do you plan to keep the costs to where the universities say it would keep uh, because international students are, uh, oh, they say that international students are treated like cash cows, but um, I would have no problem paying what I was told I would have to. So I guess the question is about the tuition estimator and then the reality yeah. of that for international students. Yeah, look, thanks for that question. It actually shocks me a little bit. So I will absolutely look into that, why our estimator and the actual tuition uh, doesn't, doesn't coincide. 10% uh, increase uh, is not my understanding what the fees were last year. I will look into that. And I would absolutely um, assure you that international students in Canada aren't looked on as a cash cow. They absolutely are where I came from in Australia, uh, where tuitions are 35 to $55,000 a year, depending on the program. Uh, here, uh, international students are an important part of our community. They bring diversity into the community. Um, it, it's an important thing for us. And our fees international, we benchmark them across the sector in, in BC in particular, are you know under the other institutions that you might think of as the big profile universities in this province, UBC and SFU. But thanks for the question. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll look into the numbers that you provided and, uh, and you can also send me your, your email address um, later on. I'll, I'll get back to you personally on that, so thanks. Um, okay, I'm just going to look through here for the next one. Um, can you identify any benefits to having a separate legal body, the foundation, for managing endowment investments? It seems all seems other BC universities have avoided this model and allow the more transparent uh, board of governors to manage these types of funds. Well, actually, it, it is part of BC law and taxation to have a separate foundation under the conditions that... Uh, the charitable trusts are set up. And so we are just, we're complying with law. The other universities also have foundations. Um, 
And uh, across Canada, you also see many foundations out of sync, I guess, if you like, with the, with the university. Whereas I actually think, as I mentioned earlier, our socially responsible investment policy that the foundation created um, three years ago is, is a leader in this country. And, and, you know, I've asked for this benchmarking data. So how do we compare to other universities across Canada? And I'm very comfortable uh, saying that uh, I think we're absolutely showing leadership in the, the space around socially responsible investment. Um, it, but in terms of the foundation, it is a legal requirement of the way that our charitable fundraising has been set up. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, we're going to try and get to two questions here, hopefully. Uh, Serena says, how do students deal with insecure living environment outside of the campus when they share the living environment with their landlord? What can the university do to support them because they can't be protected by the BC Tenant Act under this circumstance? Yeah, th thanks for that question. Um, I, I will have to also check into that for you. I'm not sure what the BC Tenant Act is and why it doesn't give you the same rights as any other tenant. Um, but I would say if you are struggling and having a lot of opportunities, uh, having a lot of challenges in your housing, um, you know, work through uh, the student services and, uh, you know, see if somebody will provide you assistance. If, if you can't find any satisfaction, you can always uh, come into my office. I'll see what I can do. But I, I, I actually just will say, you know, I'm not quite familiar enough yet with, uh, with BC law and BC uh, Tenancy Act, but we'll certainly look into that. While I'm on that topic, um, you know, one of the things I would really like to address is, um, is accessibility to, to good housing and the price of housing. And, and I am working currently with a number of people in the city and across the university to try to look at, can we, you know, work on a mechanism to try to get a lower cost housing here for our students, both our undergraduate and our graduate students. And I'm not sure what the, what the final or the perfect answer is yet, but we're looking at different vehicles and mechanisms to try to make sure that we've got uh, uh, high quality, uh, lower cost housing available to many of our students. So it's something we'll look at uh, how we can try to do that. Uh, we don't obviously have huge cash piles to, uh, to build our own places, but maybe we can work in partnership with uh, the private entities to build uh, lower cost, cheaper housing near the university. Thanks, Kevin. I'm a little disappointed you haven't read the BC Tenant Act in your first 131 yeah, days you as know, president. Uh, <laughs> 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 I promise um, okay. to do it tonight, Allie. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, okay, well, we'll try and get to this last question. Um, is there, could there be a way to get in touch with the university, uh, the staff and professors regarding challenges that arise from remote learning? Yeah, look, I think there are a number of mechanisms for students uh, through Student, student Central um, to identify where you've had those challenges. And as I, I think, as I said earlier, I mean, you know, contact your department chair um, in particular as a starting point to say, I'm either struggling with, with the online learning or I don't, I don't understand, uh, you know, what my professor is trying to accomplish or I'm having issues with my assessment. I think always start within your local unit and hopefully the chairs will work with you to resolve your issues, but there is a, a lot of support available uh, to our students through Student Central um, to deal with issues around coursework. And finally, if you wouldn't, if you don't get satisfaction through those mechanisms, uh, there is the University Ombudsman who, um, you know, I think is a, it's a great resource for students. It's a, it's a service that, um, um, isn't controlled by the university whatsoever. So it's a very um, um, partisan uh, group to, to work with. And, um, you know, um, try those three mechanisms. All right, that's the end. Kevin, I'll throw it back to you for some closing remarks. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ali. Well, I, I guess, first of all, Ali, a big thank you to you for, for moderating and, um, and actually, you know, running the show today. Uh, but thanks for all the questions. Uh, they really helped me understand, um, you know, what the opportunities are for the university, but what the challenges are as a UVic undergraduate student. I hope you found the. Uh, I hope you found it informative. I know it's lots of information in a very short period of time. Um, the important thing is, if you didn't get a chance today to share your idea or ask your question, uh, we have a president's suggestion box. It's uvic.ca backslash suggestion box. And we look at that uh, almost on a daily basis. There's lots of great ideas that come into the suggestion box. There's lots of questions. And we try to respond to everybody. So please use that. And I thought the last thing we'll do before we, uh, before we wrap up, we'll have a, one more quick poll. So let's launch uh, poll number three. 
And the poll is basically asking you, what are the effective ways for me as president or my leadership team, in fact, to connect and communicate with you? So I really appreciate the feedback on that to see whether things like these town halls are of any value or whether other mechanisms that you rather uh, use to try to have uh, my leadership team at the university connect and communicate with you, to listen to you, and to also tell you what, what it is we're up to. So we're about 60% through voting, and it looks like uh, multiple mechanisms of uh, connectivity resonate with many of you. So I think that just tells us we've got to be fairly uh, fairly diverse in, in how we are connecting. Um, and it looks like uh, emails and videos aren't so popular. So that's a, that's a great piece of news. Um, I'm trying to get uh, more connected in social media. So I'm glad to see that coming up. Um, and I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased today that um, uh, town halls appear as, as the equal tied in first place, 24%. Uh, you know, this town hall today, I think is a, um, is a great opportunity for me to connect with students. I absolutely hope in September, we'll be able to have uh, big town halls and big lecture theaters where we can sort of have that face-to-face -face interaction. But um, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for the poll. So we can take the poll down now, I think. And um, I guess I would just say as we as as we wrap up, you know, again, thank you everybody um, for your feedback today. I'm I'm really excited and hopeful for the year ahead. I think um, you know if we listen to what's been uh, um, broadcast from the public health officer, we're going to get a chance to get back uh, on, uh, face to face to have that experience we all crave at a university. And I'm really looking forward to a time when uh, we can connect together. In the interim, if you are lucky enough to be on campus, and I believe we've got about uh, 3,000 students on campus right now and 40% of our academic and staff. If you see uh, a big tall guy walking around looking like he's lost, it's probably me. Please walk up and say hi. Uh, happy always to meet students. And I also just want to end on, uh, by thanking um, all of the people that went into making this town hall happen. It's a, it's a, it actually is a big production, believe it or not. There's a lot of technical issues that have to be dealt with. I'd especially like to, uh, to thank UBSS and Ali uh, for being the MC today. And I really look forward to connecting with you again in the future. So uh, thanks everybody. Thanks so much, Kevin. It's uh, very exciting to see uh, how open you have been uh, to listening uh, on your listening tour. I, I know certainly the Reddit AMA was quite a highlight for, uh, for me to see you jumping on. Um, thank you to all of the students who are here today uh, joining us on the town hall. Uh, special thank you to Alex and Sarah for their time today. Um, as every, as well as everybody on the event team, as Kevin said, that was able to make uh, this possible. Um, such a valuable experience. Uh, just a reminder that the recording will be posted on the pre president's listening tour webpage, which is uvic.ca slash listening tour. The link is also in the chat. Um, and yeah, from all of us, uh, thank you guys so much for, for joining us today. Thanks everybody.